In this video, we will learn about both inverse functions and composition of functions. So what is an inverse function? An inverse function, first of all, the function must be a bijection. And let's remember what bijection means, both one to one and onto, meaning that, again, looking at my um, example down here, this is onto because there are no elements of B that haven't been mapped to from set A. It is one to one because each of these elements is only mapped to one time. So it has to be a bijection. And the inverse, and note the way that we write this, f to the negative one, which just um, tells us that is the inverse function, is the function that maps from B to A um, such that essentially it would look like this. A is one, two, three, four, and so five, because three maps to five, then five will map to three. Since two maps to seven, seven will map to two. Since three maps to five, five, oh, I already did that one. <laughs> Since one maps to six, six will map to one. And since eight, uh, four maps to eight, eight will map to four. So this function would be considered the inverse function as it maps those elements of B back to the elements of A. And so again, we write that the inverse function would map Y to X if and only if the function mapped X to Y. So it's essentially undoing it, it's the inverse. So let's take a look at an example to see if this function f is invertible. And this function f is the function from a, b, c to 1, 2, 3, 4, such that f of a equals 1, f of b equals 3, f of c equals 4. And the question asks, is f invertible? And then if we answer yes to that, then we answer what is the inverse? So looking at this, I know in order for my function to be invertible, my function must be one to one and onto. And here is a problem right here is that this is not onto. Therefore, it's not a bijection. And we need it to be a bijection so it's not invertible. Let's try another. Let's look at another example. We have now the function f that maps the integers to the integers such that f of x is equal to x plus three. Same questions, is it invertible? If so, what's the inverse? So we'll start by answering, is it invertible? How do I know it's invertible? It has to be one to one which I'm going to check, and it has to be onto, which I'm going to check. Keep in mind, one to one asks us to determine, is every element in the range mapped to by just one element in the domain? So let's look at an example. If I say f of a is equal to f of b, that has to imply that a is equal to b. So let's say seven is my solution. So f of a is equal to seven. What does that tell me? That a plus three is equal to seven, which means a must be four. So the question is, is there any other value if f of b equals seven, then that tells me b plus three equals seven which tells me that b is four. And so we can see that if seven is equal to seven, that four is equal to four. If f of a is equal to f of b, it must be that a and b were the same value. So is this one to one? Yes. Now let's take a look at onto. Remember that onto tells us that every value in the range or excuse me, every value in the codomain must be mapped to by one element in the domain. 
So the question is, is there ever going to be an integer that isn't mapped to by some other integer? So again, we've just shown that if we want to map to 7, all we have to do is use 4. 4 maps to 7. What if we wanted to map to 8? What value plus 3 is equal to 8? Well, 5 maps to 8. Is there ever going to be anything here in the codomain that doesn't have some value that maps to it? And the answer is no. Everything is going to get mapped to. So is this onto? Yes, it is. So because this is both one-to-one -one and onto, it is a bijection and therefore invertible. So those are things that I would write down on an assignment or test. I'm just saying them out loud to you. Now the next question says, if so, what's the inverse? Well, for a function like this, it's actually pretty easy to determine. If I want to determine the inverse of this, I'm actually just going to replace f of x with x, and I'm going to replace x with f inverse of x and solve to get x inverse by itself. So here I would subtract 3 from each side, so I would get x minus 3 is equal to f inverse of x, and that in fact is my inverse. And of course I would write it because I'm a freak like that and I have to have everything in the right order, I would write it like this. f inverse of x is equal to x minus 3. So keep in mind that the inverse just has to undo whatever our original function did. So our original function added 3 to the value, so we have to undo plus 3 by subtracting 3. So now let's switch gears a bit and look at the composition of functions. And the composition of functions essentially tells us that, and note the way that we're going to denote the composition of functions, which could be written this way, or could be written this way. Um, essentially what it tells us is that if we compose the two functions, and f maps a to b, so this is function f, and g maps b to c, then if I compose those functions, so I'm saying take the function f of x first and then apply the function g of x, then g of f of 1, for instance, 1 would map to 6 based on function f, 6 would map to 10 based on function g, so the composition of functions would give me that, you know, g of f of 1 equals 10. Again, I could also write that as g of f of 1. Remember on these just to work from the inside out. So don't be tempted to do g as the function first, but instead do f as the function first. So let's try an example to make sure we understand how composition of functions works. And first I want to do f of g of 1. So f of g of 1 would tell me that I want to find f of g of 1. So g of 1 is, excuse me, 1 squared minus 2 because g of x is x squared minus 2. So I'm really just finding f of 1 squared is 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. I'm finding f of negative 1, which is negative 1 plus 3, based on the function f, which gives me 2. So that gives me the answer 2. Now that can get a little bit confusing, and so instead of doing it that way, let's do f of g of x which means let's go ahead and just rewrite the entire function. So instead of having to first find g of x and then plug it in for the function f, I can just plug it right into my new function. So how will this work? Well, I'm doing f of x squared minus 2. And f says take x plus 3, but essentially we're saying take x squared minus 2 plus 3. So x squared minus 2 plus 3 is the same as x squared plus 1. And this is my new function for the composition of functions. But let's double check that f of g of 1 using that new function still gives me 2. So 1 squared 
plus 1 is 1 plus 1, which is 2, and so it checks out. So I feel okay about myself. So let's do the exact same thing this time for g of f of x. And we're going to start actually with g of f of 1 like we did on the last example. And so I'm saying let's take g of f of 1. f of 1 is 1 plus 3. And that means I'm taking g of 4. And g of 4 would be 4 squared minus 2. 4 squared minus 2 is 16 minus 2, or 14. So now let's take a look at g of f of x instead and see if we can come up with a function like we did for f of g of x where we can just plug in the value instead of having to go through all of the steps. So I want to do g of x plus 3, which means my x is now x plus 3, so x squared minus 2 looks like this. So I can leave it like this, or I could FOIL this out. x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 2, which is, running out of room over here, x squared plus 6x plus 7. Let's check our work. g of f of 1, which we already know should be 14. Let's see if we get that again. 1 squared plus 6 times 1 plus 7 would be 1 plus 6 plus 7, which is 14, and so it checks out. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at some useful functions you should know. So maybe you know them all, maybe you've seen half of them and the other half are new to you, but these are very common functions that are going to keep coming up throughout your studies, so just make sure that you know them.